Well, good morning. morning. Welcome, and to some of you, welcome back to Dearborn Christian Fellowship. It's good to have you here this morning. I'm Pastor Brad, and we want to say thanks for joining us, whether that's in person or through our live stream this morning, as we have come to worship the living God. What a year 2020 has been so far, and yet we want to continue to proclaim the goodness, the providence, and the faithfulness of our God in the midst of a fallen world. If you are in Christ, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God will never let you go, that God will always hold fast to his people. If you're joining us this morning for one of the first times, whether that's in person or online, we would love to get to know you better as a church and answer any questions that you might have of us as a church. And so please right now go and fill out our digital connection card, dearborncf.com connect, and one of the pastors will follow up with you over the next week. Just a few announcements for us before we receive the call to worship this morning. As I mentioned last week, in these weeks and months ahead, as we are now gathering together to worship, but also COVID is continuing to spread throughout the population, if you do find out that you are COVID positive or think you might have the symptoms, please let the church office know that as quickly as you can so that we can inform those who were in the building with you. We will keep all that information confidential, but we want to make sure we are loving and caring for one another well. Second, a reminder that our Tuesday night prayer services have moved back to a Zoom format from meeting in the parking lot to accommodate more more people. So please look for that link in tomorrow morning's dashboard and join us Tuesday night at 7 o'clock for a time of prayer. Number three, VBS has been adjusted this year to accommodate our inability to host that event on our campus. And so several volunteers have been working extremely hard to create VBS take-home kits for parents to walk their kids through during the course of a week. You do need to register and sign up for those in the dashboard tomorrow morning. So please do that. And then they will be available for pickup in two Sundays on Sunday, August 2nd. And finally, just a couple reminders for us this morning. Once you are seated, and many of you know this already, you are welcome to take off your masks, but you certainly do not have to do that. And if you have kids with you, we recognize the struggle sometimes of having kids sit through an entire worship service. Just a reminder, the coffee house is reserved and available for parents of young kids if that would make you feel more comfortable during the service. But you certainly don't have to do that. We are so glad that you are here and that they are here. And so wherever you're at this morning, I want to invite you to rise with me as we receive the call to worship from Psalm 77. Cry aloud to God. Cry aloud to God and he will hear you. In the day of trouble, seek the Lord. In the night, stretch out your hand to him. For God will lead his people like a flock. He is the God who works wonders. Come, let us worship that king. If you're able and willing to remain standing with us as we sing a couple songs to the Lord, that would be great. If you need to sit down, that's okay too. Lord, let 
of you as our King and our Lord. Father, thank you for the privilege it is to gather together the unique way you meet with us in private and in public. They're different and they can't be duplicated in another way. So thanks for this experience of your presence together. Lord, it makes us just want to shout to you. You are our King, our Savior, and so we do shout. We give, lift our voices together in praise. Amen.
Part of our service where we pause to reflect what the Lord would have us invest in his kingdom. The scriptures say in Matthew 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A friend of mine put it this way, I'll show you where your heart is, show me your checkbook. Uh, and I think that's true. We can't pass plates as we traditionally do because of obvious health concerns. Uh, but what we do have is plenty of opportunities to give in other ways. Some of you may have already done that. There is a box out the second set of doors on the right by the kids' life room, but don't get up from your seats now. It's not there now. It's there before the service and after the service. So if you'd like to drop an offering in there, you can do that. You can also give online. You can send a check to the office. I'm pretty sure any way you want to give us money, we'll figure out a way to take it. So, uh, But it's an important part of worship. It's uh, about our hearts and investing in what God is all about. So let's just reflect. Maybe some of you will be praying about how much to give or how to designate it even as we sing.
considered me a friend Capture my heart again Capture my heart again Deeper than the deepest ocean We have this prayer jar here at uh, Dearborn Christian Fellowship, and in it you see uh, pieces of paper. These have the names of people that we desire as a church. Uh, we desire to see them come to know Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord. Earlier, I picked out the name Erica from that jar, and I'll be praying for Erica in my prayer this morning. I want to encourage you to pray for her and for somebody else that you know, a friend, a family member, a coworker, somebody that you know that also needs Jesus in their life. Please join me as we continue to worship by going to the Lord together in prayer. Lord, we come to exalt you, to lift up your name as great. Your praise is on our lips. We boast about you from the depths of our souls, desiring that all who feel rejected and unjustly afflicted will hear about you and experience the joy that we have found in you. We glorify your name together and exalt your name as one. Many of us have tasted and seen that you are good. We've taken refuge in you and found deliverance in your shelter. We've sought you out for salvation from life's troubles and man's evils and you have saved us. Even when the fiercest predators and strongest villains seem to lack what they desire, you give us all that we need. So we look to you and your radiance is reflected in us. We need not walk in shame among the wise and strong of this world because we walk in the protection of our God and his angels. God, you are truly great. As your people, we try to bear your image well and represent your kingdom as ambassadors and citizens. Forgive us when we fail you. Blot out the wickedness in our lives. Keep our tongues from speaking lies and other evil things. Stop us from spreading gossip and slandering each other. Help us to seek and pursue peace instead of perpetuating evil and division in this world. May our lips be full of good things to say about others, even our enemies. There's so much we wanna pray about and bring to you today. We have the ongoing COVID pandemic that we would pray against and ask you to bring an end to quickly, either from miraculous means or through a medical discovery. We also still feel the tensions that exist between folks of different race or ethnic backgrounds. Lord, it's ridiculous to see these surface appearances instead of your image in each other. We create these needless barriers which leads to strife that has no reason to exist. 
Show us how to navigate this divide peacefully. We continue to pray for Adam Jones. We pray for some useful discovery by doctors to treat his seizures effectively. Help us to know how to support the Jones family as the body of Christ should. We also pray for Beth Westra. Give her cancer treatments the necessary boost they need for her full recovery and freedom from that disease. Give the Westra family relief from the many stresses they deal with every day. We bring Grand, uh, Dan Greenwell to you and ask for special favor for him to learn how to live without sight in his right eye. Thank you that it wasn't worse and that he is still with us. Give extraordinary wisdom to Kevin and Jen DeVries as they plan and schedule future medical procedures. We lift up Wes Thorpe again. Lord, you know our desire is for complete restoration and healing for him, no matter what the doctors say. But may your will be done in his life. And may we see your blessings along the way. Holy Spirit, speak to Erica today, wherever she is. We desire for her and all the others in this jar to know you and honor you as Savior and Lord. Give Pastor Brad extra energy and stamina today to preach the message that you gave him. Use his work and study for your glory today. We ask these things in the powerful and life-giving name of Jesus. Amen. All right, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. Matthew 13. Matthew's about two-thirds of the way through your Bibles. Um, it's the first of the four Gospels, and if you are joining us this morning, either in person or online, and you do not own a Bible, please let us know that, either through our website uh, or before you leave the building this morning. We would like nothing more than to get one of those to you. This morning is our third week in our four-part series in Matthew's Gospel entitled Kingdom Parables, Not What You Thought, and it covers almost the entirety of chapter 13 of Matthew. As we see, Jesus tells seven different parables, all seeking to reveal some aspects, some elements of the kingdom of God, which is interesting because in the Bible, the number seven represents wholeness, completion, perfection. And as a Jewish writer who knew his Old Testament well, Matthew would have known the significance of using seven parables to describe for us the wholeness, the fullness of the kingdom of God. Now, the Jewish people of the first century, as we've said many times, were expecting, they were waiting for the kingdom of God to come into the world, to be ushered in by the Messiah. But as we have seen through 13 chapters, the kingdom was proving to be different than what they expected. It was not living up to their expectations. And we saw last week that was even true for Jesus' own disciples as he was ushering in the kingdom. And and they're seeing themselves in a small percentage of people respond to Jesus with faith. Meanwhile, the large majority of the crowds and the peoples were rejecting him and were being unaffected by his message. How could that be? How could the kingdom of God be having such little impact? And last week we saw that parables now become the dominant form of teaching that Jesus uses in his ministry to explain the kingdom of God. So that his people, those who have had their hearts changed to be good soil, would see and understand the secrets of the kingdom of God, how it grows, who is in it, what our expectations should be like in between Jesus' first coming and his coming again. Meanwhile, those whose hearts remain hard, they will hear, they will see, but they will not understand. They will prove that their hearts are still rocky, thorny, and shallow soil. Today, we're going to see two more parables, the parable of the mustard seed, and the parable of the leaven, as Jesus continues to explain to his disciples the sovereign plan of God for ushering his kingdom into this world. And so now, as we listen to the voice of God from the word of God for what scripture says, God says. Wherever you're at this morning, the sanctuary, the lobby, the coffee house, or your homes, I want to invite you to rise with me if you are able, as we stand in attention to the voice of our God from his word, Matthew 13 Verses 31 to 35. 
He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants. It becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophets. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. This is God's holy and inspired word for you. Let's pray. Father, all scripture is breathed out by your Holy Spirit. It is useful. It is necessary for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that we might be equipped for every good work you have planned for us. So equip us, change us, shape us today. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. And together we say, amen. Please be seated. Growing up rich or growing up poor is certainly no guarantee of future wealth. There are obvious advantages to growing up having more than you need and obvious disadvantages to growing up in want. And yet we can all probably think of the individual who grew up having everything they needed, yet they developed a terrible work ethic, were unmotivated, relied upon others to take care of them, and squandered what they had. Meanwhile, we can all probably think of the person who grew up poor, barely able to get three square meals a day, and yet because of the struggle of their situation, worked incredibly hard, became self-taught, depended upon nobody else, and found a way to become successful financially. Their disadvantage proved to be an advantage because of what it created within them. And these rags-to-riches stories, as well as the riches-to-rags stories, reveal to us that what you start with guarantees nothing. Rather, it is what you do with what you have that determines the outcome. Let's recall for a moment the mission that Jesus gave to his disciples back in chapter 10. He said, go and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Call people to repent of their sin and to trust in Jesus for salvation, as the Messiah, as God in the flesh. And oh, by the way, as you do that, life is going to be incredibly difficult. You will experience tremendous persecution and hardship. You'll be brought before governors. You'll be brought before courts. You'll be arrested and flogged. But this is the way the kingdom is going to go. Jesus presents this massive vision to the 12, and he tells them, you're going to be the ones who go out and accomplish it. Now, just imagine how overwhelming that must have felt to the disciples at that time. Maybe not Peter. Maybe Peter got pumped up about it. But probably the rest of them, they looked at themselves, they looked at their situations, they looked at their resources, and they thought and felt like a poor man trying to become rich in the world, trying to make their way into a king's palace. Certainly the odds would have been stacked against them. And where do they begin? Twelve poor young Jewish boys following this Jesus who himself admits to being poor, having no permanent place to lay his head. They had so little in terms of resources and yet they were given this massively huge vision to go and accomplish. And maybe you look at the kingdom's potential growth in our world today, and it feels just as overwhelming to you. In the first two parables that Jesus told, the parable of the sower and the parable of the weeds, Jesus gives an honest explanation to his disciples about what it's going to be like to live on mission in the kingdom. The word of God is going to go forth, and it is going to fall on good soil. It's going to take root. It's going to grow. But there's only one type of soil in which that will happen. There are three types of soil in which the seed will fall and it will produce nothing. And oh, by the way, the weeds are going to continue to grow up alongside of the wheat. And they're going to bring hardship and persecution against the church as it seeks to live out 
the kingdom of God in this world. See, Jesus doesn't sugarcoat it for his disciples. He's not a bait and switch salesman. He is honest about what it's going to take to advance the kingdom of God in this world. But in today's parables and in the parables we'll see next week, Jesus now moves to give his disciples and us hope. Yes, what you see looks small. Yes, what you see looks impossible. Yes, what you see looks insignificant to accomplish the mission I have given you. But take heart, the king is in control. And so what we want to see in our text today is that because Jesus promises that his kingdom is going to expand both in its size and in its scope, we must be a people marked by great hope and optimism, regardless of the size of our efforts. We'll see this first through the promised disproportionate growth of the kingdom. Second, we'll hear Jesus reveal the all-encompassing scope of the kingdom. And third, we're going to see Jesus reveal a promise that his kingdom now fulfills. So first, let's listen to Jesus promise the disproportionate growth that the kingdom is going to experience. The parable of the mustard seed, it wasn't hard for his disciples to understand. It took a lot of faith to believe it, but on a concept level, they didn't have to go and seek out further explanation, which was required for the parable of the sower and the parable of the mustard seed. No, the message of this parable, it's pretty simple. The kingdom of God, it's like a mustard seed, which at that time was the smallest seed they had discovered. This seed was so incredibly small. It was so incredibly insignificant in its appearance. And Jesus says to his disciples, this is what you're seeing right now. And this is what you're feeling right now. The kingdom of God, it looks small. It looks insignificant, especially compared to the Roman Empire that we're living in the midst of. But, Jesus says, when that small and insignificant seed takes root, it's going to grow to become larger than any other plant in the garden. Don't be fooled by humble beginnings. The final result is going to prove to be mind-blowing. And in this short and simple parable, Jesus promises that the final results of the kingdom of God will be disproportionate to the size of the seeds that get planted. You're going to look at the seed, and you're not going to feel a whole lot of confidence in its outcome, and yet its outcome will prove to exceed your expectations. Take heart, disciples. This is what the expansion of the kingdom of God will be like. Now we get to sit here 2,000 years after Matthew wrote his gospel, and we get to testify that, yes, this secret of the kingdom of God is no secret any longer. These 12 men, though they looked small, though they looked insignificant, they were the mustard seeds that began the kingdom of God coming into this world as they took the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ forward so that only 300 years after the birth of the church, living in the midst of an oppressive Roman empire, historians testify that at that time there was already five to eight million Christians living in that place. And now today we know that Christianity is the largest religion in the world. You cannot deny that what was a small and insignificant seed in its appearance produced a tree of disproportionate size to the seeds that got planted. Jesus promised this would happen, and as the sovereign king over his kingdom, Jesus always keeps his promises. But this is not the only application of this parable. This is a promise parable for the entirety of the already but not yet of the kingdom of God until Christ returns. And this parable can be applied to our own lives individually. This is the way that God continues to cause his kingdom to come and to grow and to expand into his world as he takes seemingly small and insignificant seeds, efforts, investments made by his disciples, made by his church. We tend to be drawn to the flashy, right, to the bright lights, to the large crowds. And yet from that day forward, 
God has been causing his church and his kingdom to grow through what we call the ordinary means of grace. The preaching of the word, the prayers of the people, the administrations of the sacraments, and the shepherding of God's people by the elders of the church. So that more disciples are made as they profess faith in Christ and disciples are matured as they learn to obey all that Christ has commanded us. And on the surface, these ordinary means of grace, they don't look like they do a whole lot, do they? And the world looks at the strategy that God has given his church to grow and they laugh. Your strategy is to get a preacher up there every week and talk about a crucified Savior? Your strategy is to eat bread and drink juice and dunk people underwater? Those are pretty small seeds. You think that by individuals praying for their, for their loved ones, for their neighbors, for their coworkers, and then sharing the gospel with them, that that's going to produce a massive tree? Not likely. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.18 how the world is going to view the seeds of the church, the seeds of the kingdom. He says this. For the word of the cross is folly, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And Paul affirms in Romans 10 the necessity of preaching and of witnessing to those not yet in the kingdom of God. He says this, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? We think to ourselves, God, if you just showed up and did a miracle and knocked people off their feet, that'd be so much more effective and so much more efficient. And yet God has ordained that his kingdom would grow, that his church would grow through the ordinary through the unspectacular, through the insignificant mustard seeds of our life that we plant and he takes and he promises to grow into a massive tree that far out, outreaches the size of the seeds that are planted. And when that happens, guess who gets the glory? Parents, is this not the call upon our lives as we seek to disciple our own children? Moment by moment, day after day, month after month, year after year, planting seed after seed after seed into their life. And in those moments, they look small and insignificant, not doing a whole lot, reading the Bible with them before they go to bed, teaching them how to pray, yes, before mealtimes, but throughout the day as situations arise so they know God is always with me and always desires to hear from me. Helping him memorize scripture, maybe even Heidelberg Catechism question and answers. These are the seeds that God will take and cause the kingdom to explode in their life and through their life, far exceeding our expectations. God can take mustard seeds and turn them into miracles. And so Jesus intends to give his disciples hope by first showing the disproportionate growth that the kingdom will incur but then he moves to show the vast reach of the kingdom. And so second this morning, let's hear Jesus reveal the all-encompassing scope of the kingdom. This second parable about the leaven, it is deeply intertwined with the first parable about the mustard seed. Without the second parable, the disciples might have thought that the kingdom was going to be a massive, stationary Single location kingdom like a tree to which everyone else must then come and flock. Which in fact was how Israel was set up in the Old Testament. A nation of God's people experiencing the blessings of God so that they might be a blessing to the nations. And to whom the nations would then gather and be restored to God. See Israel was always to be about being a blessing to the nations to gather in the nations. But now the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ was going to be a bit different than that. No longer a single stationary kingdom, physical kingdom, but now a spiritual kingdom that would spread throughout the earth. This kingdom would be like yeast. That once it enters the flour, once it enters the dough, spreads and makes its way through every part of the dough, changing and affecting every part of it. 
The kingdom of God was not going to be just a massive stationary single location tree, but it would spread to the entirety of the earth, affecting and changing every part. Now, this parable also was not difficult for the disciples to understand. And so no further explanation was sought. And again, we can see the fulfillment of this promised parable, even before the scriptures are done being written and compiled, is the whole message of the book of Acts is to testify how the gospel, which started in Jerusalem, has now spread to Judea, the wider area, then spread to Samaria in the north, and spread to the ends of the earth. Like yeast that spreads throughout the entirety of the dough, the gospel has spread and will spread to every corner of the globe. And yet, this continues to be the call and the work of the church. Right? To go and make disciples of all nations because there are unreached people groups still on the earth that do not have the gospel in their own language, that do not have enough churches to disciple the believers that become Christians. Especially in what we would call the 1040 window. Go home and Google that. I don't have time to explain it this morning. But places like the Middle East and parts of Africa and parts of Asia. And so we need to support and send missionaries there. We need, for some of us, maybe we need to radically change our life, become missionaries and go there. So that disciples are made of all nations. And we all have people in our circles of influence in life that need to have the yeast of the kingdom spread to them so that it would change and transform their life by the gospel. But not only does the kingdom spread from location to location, Again, this parable can be applied to our lives individually. As Christ desires to change and mold and shape and mature the lives of his disciples in every part of our being, in every part of our soul. Paul states in 2 Corinthians 10 that our goal is to take every thought, every thought captive To obey Christ. What a picture that is of the all encompassing work of discipleship that we're called to be about in our lives. Like we talked about several times in the series on kingdom living, disciples are called to engage in gospel tension, which means we are completely and 100% secure. In our standing before God because of the righteousness and the obedience of Christ that has been transferred and credited to our account. We did not earn that. We did not deserve that. We cannot live in a way that maintains that. It is ours by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. But now because of that, we respond in gratitude. We desire to wage war against our flesh, wage war against our sin nature, not to earn anything from God, but simply to love and obey the one who has called us to himself. And so part of our mission as disciples is to strive for obedience and maturity in every aspect of our lives. Our finances, our relationships, our pride, our fears, our anxieties, our witness, our thoughts, our words, our idolatries. Discipleship is not just about coming to church and doing religious things on Sunday mornings in front of religious people. Discipleship is about having our whole life changed. In the same way that leaven affects the entire lump of dough. So that we're transformed more and more into the image of Christ. There is no room in your life that Christ does not desire to enter and do a remodel project on. So that you're conformed more and more into his image. And one last brief application of the leaven. Remember that God in the gospel of the kingdom is seeking to redeem and restore every part of creation that was affected by the fall. In Genesis 3, we've said this throughout the series. Not only our relationship with God, though that is primary, but also our relationships to ourselves, to one another, and to the world, which means the arts and education and industry and business and finance and medicine and law, etc., etc. The gospel should be good news to every part of society and culture. As the kingdom citizens seek to bring the kingdom to bear on the world around us. As we live out God's commands, live out God's design for his world, it should affect every aspect of society. Now, that requires way more time than I can give it this morning. I only mention it so you can see that the scope of the kingdom of God is truly 
all-encompassing. God liked his world so much when he made it, he wants all of it back. Finally, and briefly this morning, let's see Jesus reveal the great promise that his kingdom now fulfills. Verses 34 and 35 at the end of our text says that Jesus told them all these things in parables to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And then he quotes from Psalm 78 verse 2. Now, I can't read all of Psalm 78 for you this morning. It's way too long. Please go home and read that later today. Psalm 78 is all about how Israel, as God's people, rebelled constantly, rejecting God and turning from him, even as he continued to be gracious and loving and merciful to her. And at the end of Psalm 78, it ends with God establishing and preserving the tribe of Judah from which would come King David, from which would come the Messiah who would ultimately redeem and restore God's people to himself. Even as God's people were faithless, God continued to be faithful to his promises to her. And by ending with Psalm 78, Matthew is showing us something. He's showing us how Israel has not learned from her past. That just as Israel had rejected God and turned from him in the Old Testament, so in the first century and tragically today, the majority of the Jewish people, not all the Jewish people, but the majority are still rejecting his servant, his Messiah. And here is the fulfillment of that promise which we find in the parable of the mustard seed. Verse 32 says this. But when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. So that, pay attention to this, so that the birds of the air come and make their nests in its branches. Now, to understand the, part, the point of the parable, you didn't need that last sentence or that last phrase, did you? The tree had grown into a disproportionate size than the seeds that were planted. So why then go and talk about birds coming and making their nests in its branches? Well, I'm glad you asked. Jesus here is alluding to the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel. Chapter 17 where God had come to Ezekiel and given him a fable to go and tell to Israel, who at that time was in exile in Babylon. And in this fable, Israel is represented by a tree. A tree that had been uprooted and scattered, remember exile, because of her continued rejection of the provisions, grace, love, and mercy that God had shown her. And because of that, the birds in the fable, which represented the Gentiles, the nations, the non-Jewish people, no longer had a place to come and make their nest. You see the problem. Israel was always supposed to be a blessing to the nations, to gather in the nations, but where are the nations to gather when Israel has been uprooted and scattered? And so in the fable, God moves to plant a new tree, a messianic tree, by taking a twig from the original tree and planting it anew. And this tree bears strong branches. It bears good fruit, and it becomes a noble cedar tree. And here's the promise that we hear God speak in Ezekiel 17, 23. God says this, And under it, meaning the new messianic tree, under it will dwell every kind of bird. In the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. And in alluding to Ezekiel 17, Jesus is announcing that in the kingdom of God, not only the Jewish people, but now all sorts of people, every sort of bird, all nations, all Gentiles are now called to come and dwell by faith in the king, by making their nest in the tree that is the kingdom of God. Jesus is proclaiming in this short and simple parable 
that in the kingdom of God, the promises God made to Abraham back in Genesis 12, 15, and 17 are now being fulfilled through his line, through his seed. That Abraham now is the father of many nations. That, that his offspring has brought blessing to all nations and that his offspring now outnumber the stars that are in the sky. And Paul affirms this is true in Galatians 3 when he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in what? In Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are what? Abraham's offspring and heirs according to to the promise. Though Israel had failed to gather in the nations, all people, all nations are now called to come and dwell in the kingdom of God by faith in its king. See, Jesus has established the kingdom of God. It started with humble beginnings, but has grown into a massive tree that seeks to encompass every part of the earth and every part of our lives and now calls all people from all nations to come and to find their home with Christ as their king. Under his branches there are rest, there is rest, there is shade, there is life eternal, and there is unending joy. And so this morning, if you have not yet come to that king, if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus and found that life eternal and that unending joy, do so today. And he offers you rest in the branches of his tree. For all of us, may we be a people of great hope and optimism that our God will continue to cause the small and the insignificant to produce a great result, a great harvest, and bring glory to his name. Let's pray. Father, when you speak, it is a trustworthy word. As the sovereign king over your kingdom, Jesus, we know that you keep every promise you make. Holy Spirit, grow our faith so that we know and believe that you are a God who makes miracles out of mustard seeds. And help us to be seed planters, kingdom investors, who then get to sit back and watch you cause the small to go, grow big. Do this work so that your kingdom comes and your will is done and your name is hallowed and praise. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. stand with us again if you're able and willing um, it is indeed by faith in those profound promises that we advance in our own pilgrimage with Jesus and that the gospel advances in the world through us so let's just proclaim our agreement with that truth of Jesus
shall be moved in the power of the gospel shed a couple of reminders before, for us before we receive the benediction this morning. Now would be a good time to put your masks back on as we are asking you to wear those on your way out this morning. The ushers will come and they will dismiss you row by row. And so after the benediction, I'm going to invite you to be seated until the ushers come and let you leave. Once they do, please make your way directly out of the building. Please don't stop in the lobby or in the hallways. There's two doors you can exit in the lobby. There's one at the end of, of the hallway where you came in. Um, and then you are welcome to uh, hang out and fellowship in the, se- in the parking lot. Um, please maintain distancing out there. And then as you exit the, the hallway, just a reminder that there is an offering box on the Kids Life counter as you leave. Also, for parents who are either at home or who are heading home, there are resources on our website for you to walk your kids through a Bible lesson either this morning or sometime this week and continue on in family worship. Receive now this benediction from our God. May the love of God the Father... And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit guard your hearts and your minds this day and throughout your life. Amen. Please be seated and have a great week.